evening. Good to have you all back tonight. Uh, second week dealing with the philosophy of counseling. We uh, had our introductory class last week, at which time uh, I confessed to a, uh, a failure of publicity. That is a failure to include information on the class in the monthly newsletter, uh, failure to announce it in the bulletin, failure to announce it on Sunday morning. And so last week we were a little bit thin in the attendance. A couple other people found out about my word of mouth, and so uh, they joined us here this evening. Uh, but once again, what happened in the intervening week? How many announcements did you read? <laughs> yeah, it's a zero. That's right. Related to, uh, related to this class. And so, uh, once again, we have smaller numbers than we would have otherwise. And there are additional people who want to take this course. Uh, we also do not have a class next week. Next week is our end of month social. Uh, the final Sunday of every month uh, is the uh, evening social rather than the PMW hour. So uh, that means that uh, we really aren't going to get into the meat of lesson number one, that is, of the reading assignment and the discussion based on that reading assignment until two weeks from tonight. Uh, what I decided I wanted to do this evening is I want to kind of give a second introduction based on what we started with last week, also to fulfill some of the promises I made last week that we closed in prayer at the end of the hour and still had not done. For example, I said we were going to read the introduction together, uh, starting on page five and work our way through the introduction. Uh, we didn't do that. I, I ended up taking too many of the rabbit trails and did not actually get to that introduction. So once again, I have that as my goal this evening. Uh, did you read the reading for tonight? You came here expecting, did you read? Dan did, okay, uh, the introduction and the first chapter, the first couple of chapters, okay. I know uh, uh, one person at least told me about it this morning. They got the book and uh, read it cover to cover. <laughs> and so they've already just completely um, devoured everything that, uh, that there was to be said in the text. And I can understand that. It's very well written. It's very engaging. It's very, uh, particularly if you find in your thinking that you are like-minded, I think it, it naturally connects like that. It naturally flows like that. So uh, I can certainly understand that as well. And I recommend that. Beyond the, what we assign week to week, uh, just keep reading. Read the whole thing. Read it through six times, a dozen times or more over the, uh, the course of this class. And I think you will profit from it in, uh, in that process. All right, let me open with a word of prayer. And then we will uh, we'll proceed with our introductory, second introductory class here this evening. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word and the privilege and blessing that we have to assemble together. Uh, Father, to study your word and to study about your word. And uh, this evening for our ministry workshop class, Father, I do thank you for this format. I thank you that we're a little bit more um, interactive. We're a little bit more uh, open for Q&A and follow-up responses. Father, uh, I thank you this class is designed to be very uh, flexible. Still, Father, uh, we have to recognize that we are assembled together in the name of Jesus Christ. We are in your presence. We want to conduct all things this evening with, uh, with the proper reverence, with the proper devotion. So... Father, we commit to you our time, we commit to you all things, asking that you would open the eyes of our understanding, give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, join me if you would in Job, Job 42. I'm going to use this as an opening passage. And then, um, then we'll talk about a couple of other things as it, uh, as it relates to this. Uh, and tell you what, before 42, go ahead and just back up to Job 40. Why don't I start with that? Job chapter 40. I have a dream to teach the book of Job someday. Uh, should I live long enough? And should I attain to a maturity level to a point that I uh, would really want to give it the best verse by verse uh, credit that I believe that the book is entitled? Um, but this is a book that reaches humanity. This reaches the emotions. This reaches affliction. This reaches... Um, amazing experiences where we are. And um, when, uh, when I first started visiting Austin Bible Church, back when Ralph Braun was the pastor, he had a, a, a series of messages over a period of time where he was really hammering the book of Job and really, for the, for the first time, uh, made clear to me that there can be emotional struggle that's not emotional revolt. You know what I'm talking about? 
uh, the doctrinal teaching related to the emotional revolt of the soul. And uh, a realm of teaching that's common in churches of our style and tradition, whereby if you have any kind of emotional turmoil, then uh, you're just in revolt. You need to get more doctrine and deal with it, grow up. Um, there actually is a place for the emotional struggle that God allows and God crafts and God uses to shape us. And the book of Job goes a long way in teaching that. The, the passions, uh, the struggles of Jesus Christ go a long way to teach that. Jesus said, my soul is troubled to the point of death. And that doesn't mean that he was a weak sister or some kind of immature believer. Or that he was an emotional revolt. He, he needed the encouragement, the consolation that comes from God the Father. I can appreciate that. So, um, the book of Job. Let me start with this, and then I'll read the introduction to Martin and Deidre Bobgett. And then I want to actually use this hour to maybe field some questions or, or survey my audience. How does that sound? Related to counseling and what it is, uh, what are your impressions? What are your impressions as far as what counseling is, how counseling works, what it's designed to do, uh, what are its benefits? What are its snares? And then, because I think we all approach the subject with some preconceptions, with some uh, some prejudices, and it might be good to at least know what those are before we start plunging into the text itself. So does that make sense? You understand where we're going to approach it on, on that basis? All right. Well, in Job 40, um, we have uh, several chapters here where the young man, Elihu, is... is um, rebuking Job. Uh, he can't believe what he's heard. He stayed quiet for some time while the older critics would criticize and then while Job would respond to them. And then finally, Elihu speaks up or Elihu speaks up. And I do find it noteworthy that uh, Elihu is not included in the Lord's rebukes, that, that he does not need to be uh, confessed over, doesn't need to be prayed for. Uh, there's no sacrifices required to atone for, for anything Elihu says, unlike uh, the three critics that appear in the earlier chapters. But then, then the Lord is going to answer Job out of the whirlwind, starting in chapter 38 and uh, moving through these, through these chapters, 38, 39, 40. And uh, the Lord's rebuke in this. And I think that his rebuke here is highly instructive for our topic, highly instructive for um, the, the, the aspect of counseling, and here's why. Look at how chapter 40 begins. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder... <coughs> Contend with the Almighty. Let him who reproves God answer it. Let me just pick up on that. I believe that this passage actually communicates a tremendous amount, not only in the immediate context of Job, but in a larger application for a whole lot of things that we encounter in the Christian way of life. When it comes to this, this name calling, when it comes to the fault finder. The fault finder. And... As you'll see in your reading, and as we are, will discuss in upcoming classes, quite a bit of what takes place in counseling is fault finding. All right, specifically and in many respects, to not only um, to you know to unearth the root causes, okay, um, to assign an un a better understanding for why you're as messed up as you are. Okay, or why you have the problems you have. What are the real causes? What are the root causes? And you start with what you think they are, and then we explore deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then we find out, uh, after, of course, hours and hours and weeks and weeks and hundreds of thousands of dollars, we start to find out, wait a minute, there's actually deeper psychological reasons that actually are feeding this. And it's amazing how many of these reasons aren't even, have nothing to do with you, or your fault, or your sin, you understand. Uh, but their repressed memories, their damage, the psychological damage that was done in your childhood, or your dad, or your mom, or the thing. Now, again, I'm in these introductory classes and in some of the upcoming classes. We want to be cautious. There are times that we'll be painting with a broad brush, in which case, uh, you know, someone could have a yeah, but they could say yeah, but. This approach doesn't do a lot of that. This approach actually will lay out scriptures and say, don't blame your dad, don't blame your mom, don't blame your repressed memories, your bad experiences. Uh, you're a sinner, you're facing divine discipline as a consequence. There are actually more biblical approaches that come closer to the truth that we're going to be looking at here tonight. In other words, they don't try to take on the role of a fault finder and blame other people. 
Okay? Um, and so to that extent, that there is actual uh, living up to responsibilities, there's an actual claiming of responsibilities, I am facing consequences for my choices. To that extent, there is a value in the exercise. But as I made comment last week, there's still a method being followed, a method that includes the procedures of psychoanalysis, the procedures of this, this dialogue, this conversation between the counselee and the counselor, all right? And a dynamic that takes place when you are in this interchange and you are conversing about things. And with the very first thing we're talking about in chapter one is the public exposure of private lives. And what happens when we fail to keep the private things that should remain private and when we have public airings of things that ought not be spoken of. And to me, that's one of the greatest snares that people get involved in when they're involved in the counseling process. Things are communicated that should not be communicated. And there's even a philosophy that is contrary to the scriptures. Okay? So, we'll touch on these areas here tonight, and then you'll see what I'm talking about as, as they unfold. All right, what uh, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. And uh, this really con uh, cuts to the core of what it is that I think we're going to have to start addressing. That what happens a lot in counseling, what happens a lot in, in um, the whole process is you end up finding fault and you blaming others, not yourself, but you also end up contending with God. You also end up disputing with God. And fundamentally, you're already in a disagreement with God when you walk in the door. Because you walk in the door with a problem you want fixed. Well, what if that's actually a circumstance God has crafted? <laughs> what if the difficulties you're undergoing right now are part of his design? See, and it may be divine discipline that he has crafted. He's got a purpose for it. It may be undeserved suffering that he's permitted. He's got a purpose for it. All right. Whatever it may be, it is an assignment he's assigned. And if he's assigned the assignment, we need to understand what his purpose is for the assignment. And not, uh, not put ourselves in the Job position here. Fundamentally, Job disagreed with everything that happened to him in the book. Wanted to know why. Demanded to know why. Actually pouted that God couldn't answer him. Look at these verses. Behold, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer even twice, and I will add nothing more. In other words, Job just kind of despairs here and says, you know what? I think I've got a good argument. I think I've got a good case. But the sad thing is, is you're God, and I'm a puny mortal, and I just I can't win this fight. 